So this is a presentation on Scientology that I gave uh, just a little over four years ago. And I kind of debated on whether or not to, to do this one because, as I think I said in a previous video, Scientology has really gone downhill. It does not have the level of cultural significance that it once had. It does not have as great of a presence in the United States or the world as it once had. And um, truth be told, people continue to leave Scientology, the Church of Scientology as an organization, in greater and greater numbers. However, out of all the presentations that I've given over the years, this is one that uh, really seems to interest and intrigue people, and understandably so, because Scientology is uh, very interesting. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of material to go through, and part of the challenge when I was going back and going back through some of this material and researching it is uh, what should I include? What should I talk about? And what should I probably leave out just for the sake of not making this uh, uh, 12 hour video? So <clears throat> there is a lot to cover. Uh, I'm not even sure at this point what I will cover and leave out. I have a general idea, but we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. Um, Scientology, despite being a fairly new religion, it was started in the 1950s, became uh, official in 1954. So Scientology as, as a practice, as an organization, the Church of Scientology started in 1954, but it actually goes back further than that to, Dianet to Dianetics in 1950. So the purpose of this video really is just to give a... Um, an analysis and um, commentary on Scientology, how it began, um, its general history, some of its high points, some of its low points, and you know there's plenty of issues that Scientology has been involved in over the years. You know, if you want to talk to a Scientologist and shut down the conversation very quickly, there's plenty of things that you can bring up. Uh, you know, obviously you can bring up all the allegations of abuse. I mean, abuse on every level. Abuse on, on a physical level, a psychological level. I mean, there have been so many lives that have um, allegedly been ruined because of things that's, that the Church of Scientology has done. And that includes its own membership and those who have been its opponents over the years as well. Not many organizations can say that they took on the IRS and won, but Scientology certainly can. They've had numerous resources and funds at their disposal. We'll go into the reasons of, on why that is. And it's, um, it's had a lot of power and a lot of influence, and it continues to have some level of pow power and influence and a lot of finances despite its declining membership. But the whole purpose of this video and the, really the purpose of this whole channel, as I've said before, is I want to encourage uh, dialogue. I want us to be able to have productive discussions with people that hold different views. And so, um, I'm not going to go too deeply into all the all the scandals, all the things that have been involved that uh, Scientology has had its name attached to, all the bad press that it's gotten. Um, there are plenty of other videos that you can find for that, but things like uh, like the whole uh, Lisa McPherson situation back in the '90s, um, you know that's. That was definitely not good press for the Church of Scientology. Uh, Operation Snow White back in the 70s. Um, the Bohemian, the infamous Bohemian Rhapsody incident from uh, from a few years ago. You know, these are all things that you can that are easily accessible in numerous videos and articles, blogs, and things like that. So. There are plenty of weapons if you just want to um, shut down a conversation very quickly with a Scientologist and maybe you run into one that's 
trying to push their views on you or trying to sell you their books or or what have you um you know there might you might want to to just say something that's going to shut down the conversation but that's something i prefer not to do you know we need to you know and i think to pursue conversations productive conversations with those who have different views than we do every chance we get and you know you want someone to walk away from their conversation with you having having thought over what they believe and why they believe it and maybe that um you know given how dangerous and destructive scientology has been i'd rather do everything that i can to lead someone out of it rather than just shut down the conversation where they're not going to listen to anything that i have to say so you want the person that you're talking to to listen to what you have to say and that's not going to happen if you just start um, putting out you know talking about all the the uh issues that the church has has had over the years you know when i talk to scientologists i like to keep the conversation on simply theological grounds and so that's mainly what this video is going to talk about we are going to talk some about the history of scientology because it's kind of difficult to talk about the theology of it and where all the beliefs came from without going into some of that history So, as I said, this presentation was given about four or five years ago, and from what I can see, the numbers here have not changed. There's not been anything, any updates as far as the number, as far as what the um, Church of Scientology claims for itself along membership lines. Um, I gave this presentation, I think, in 2015, and I couldn't really find any data newer than 2014 so i assume all all these items here still still hold true uh, to, to some extent or other so the church of scientology claims for itself anywhere from 8 to 15 million members worldwide and again this is what they claim for themselves there's been no evidence outside the church of scientology to support that data and only about 25,000 americans mm -hmm actually call themselves Scientologists. So put that in perspective with the number of uh, the general population, that's about one out of every 12,000 Americans identifies as a Scientologist. Now that does not count those who have gone to a, to a Scientology facility and have paid for courses, you know, in auditing or, or what have you. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that someone is a full-time Scientology member but there there have been people that um, that have even though they haven't joined the Church of Scientology they've gone and and taken courses you know maybe it's courses in public speaking or getting um, help with a learning disability or things like that and the data on that's pretty mixed some people claim that it's that it's helped and others say that it has not um, so I can't really make claim one way or another about that. But there are, from my understanding, three different levels of Scientology membership. So the first group, and this is the group that is the largest, is uh, public Scientologists. So if you go to a Scientology church or I uh, hesitate to call it a church, but just a, a Scientology center where courses are being offered and auditing sessions and things like that. Um, pretty much, I would say, about everyone there that you're going to run across is just a public Scientologist. The Scientologists that I met were just volunteers that were just doing that kind of thing part-time. They still had regular full-time jobs. But they're still expected to devote a great deal of their time to the organization. So that's really the largest group as far as um, as far as the number of Scientologists. They're just public Scientologists, so they constitute the majority of the membership. The second tier of membership are those. Uh, 
small number of Hollywood actors and other celebrities. So your John Travolta, or Tom Cruise, you know, so, and that's really the, I'd say the main reason that the Church of Scientology has so much money and why despite declines in membership, it still continues to have a lot of money because from its very inception, it has targeted celebrities. It's targeted Hollywood actors. And this goes all the way back to the 1950s. Apparently, um, even Elvis Presley was exposed to and, and concluded, no, nah, this isn't for me. But there have obviously been uh, many other celebrities that have been involved in it, Tom Cruise being the, the best known. As far as I know, Tom Cruise is still with the church. I, don't, I haven't read anything about him having left it. I know I'd heard some rumors, but um, from what I could see, that those rumors were not well substantiated he's still um, he's still with the church and so celebrities are are very well treated by the organization they're treated like royalty so it's um, it's very tempting even if I were you know if you're a celebrity to even if you conclude that the Church of Scientology is not is not true in what it teaches, well, you're you're still having all kinds of luxuries just poured on you. You're being treated uh, just like a king or a queen. And there have been. Um, many celebrities that have left the Church of Scientology. Uh, John Travolta, I don't know if he's still in it or not. I don't remember um, off the top of my head if he's if he's one of the ones that left. I don't think he's left it either. I think he's still with it. But there are um, there are other celebrities like um, uh, Leah Remini is the first one that comes to mind. She left the church just a few years ago, and there there have been many others, but. Um, Celebrities are um, are very well treated. They're courted. They're sought out by the church. I think that's where a lot of the, the money comes from. Now, the third level of membership, which you'll see on the screen here, is the C, the C organization known as the C Org. Now, for the, the C Org, is kind of like a... Um, like a religious order. So you think of in Christianity or Buddhism, you know, you have monastic orders. You know, you have you have monks, you have friars, you have priesthoods. The Sea Org is basically the priesthood of Scientology. These are full-time members who have dedicated their entire lives to serving the Church of Scientology. In fact, when I say entire life, life or lives, that goes beyond what you would initially think. They sign a one billion year contract, and many Sea Org members join up when they're when they're still um, very young. I've heard, I've read about you know teenagers, even as young as thirteen. I don't know how uh, young you or how old you have to be if there's a age requirement, but a lot of people join the Sea Org when they're very young and will serve in that capacity for the rest of their lives or until they finally get fed up and quit uh, whichever comes first now the problem is if you if you quit you're you're presented with a uh, a freeloaders tab so the idea is one of the quote-unquote benefits of being part of the c org is that all the training that you get there all the auditing all the resources all these things cost a great deal of money but if you're a c org member well, then, then you get all that for free. But if you leave, if you leave the Sea Org, you're presented with a ginormous tab, and you know you have to you have to pay the church back for all that. And if you don't, you know they may or may not try to pursue legal action. Um, but that's not even. Um, and I don't even know how far they would get with that. I know the main issue is that, well, if you leave, you're never going to see your friends or family again. So I think you join the Sea Org when you're very young, and after 10 or 20 years or however long you get fed up with it, you decide to leave. Well, 
Um, everyone you know, your entire life has been in that in the Sea Org. Your uh, you know, your parents, your spouse, your kids, maybe. Um, well, actually, in the Sea Org, you're not, not allowed to have kids anymore. I think that was a uh, I think it was like 1987 or something. They finally decreed that you're not allowed to have kids if you're in the Sea Org. And it's been reported that women who have gotten pregnant in the Sea Org are encouraged to get abortions. The the Church of Scientology categorically denies these allegations they, that women are encouraged to get abortions. So I just need to mention that the church den denies that. There's a lot of things that the church denies, but that many, many people who have left the organization say, yes, this is in fact what's going on. So that's one of the things that goes on behind the scenes. And by the way, all the things that the Sea Org members deal with, uh, things that go on in the upper echelons of the Church of Scientology at the executive level, all these things that go on, your typical public Scientologist doesn't even know about it. And if they've heard about it, they are they are taught to simply dismiss it, saying that it's, um, they've been taught that it's just false propaganda, that it's fake news, uh, basically. So um, they say you can't believe all the stuff that's out there on the internet or things that, that have been published in books critical of Scientology. First of all, if you're, um, if you're in, if you're a member of the Church of Scientology, you are highly discouraged from going through or looking at any kind of materials that are critical of Scientology. It, that is that is highly discouraged. And if it's found that you are doing that, then the then there are disciplinary actions within the church that can be taken against you. Um, at the very minimum, you'll be subjected to a, what's known as a security check or sec checking. And we'll get, in, get into what that means here after a while. But um, people who are in the Sea Org, it's it's a rough life. You know, you you it's kind of the same idea that like in um, in Roman Catholicism, you know, in the priesthood, when you're a priest, you take a vow of celibacy and a vow of poverty, and you're basically marrying the church in a manner of speaking. And same kind of concept here. The Sea Org members, you know, you're signing a million year or a, I'm sorry, a billion year contract. And um, I don't think I've explained that yet, what, what that means. Um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, Scientology belief is that we are all uh, immortal souls that go from one body to another over multiple lifetimes. So even though you're not in a particular body for a billion years, you still live for a billion years or more. And you know, we are infinite beings that we will go on and live forever. So when you're signing a billion year contract, that's what that means. You're uh, going uh, full steam ahead as far as being a member of the Sea Org, not just in this lifetime, but in multiple subsequent lifetimes, you're signing that contract. Like I said, it's hard to get out of. They'll present the freeloader tab. You know, we have to pay back, you know, could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases of all this money that you supposedly owe them because of all the auditing courses that you've had, all the resources that you have utilized during your time in the Sea Org. And it's it's a it's a difficult life. Um, but people who are a member of the Sea Org are are convinced that they are, you know, so to speak, doing God's work. You know, they're doing what they believe that they're called to do. It's seen as a holy calling. It's seen as a privilege. Now, you're only making about 50 bucks a week, I think the number was, and it may be more or less than that now. But uh, you're constantly under surveillance under watch while you're in the Sea Org and every time you commit any kind of penalty if you mess something up for any reason whatsoever if you're suspected of even thought crimes really I mean it's really a 1984 Orwellian kind of situation but if you're even suspected of the slightest infraction then you are fined and those fines will rack up to where you know, at the end of the week, you might you're you're lucky if you got ten bucks. So, it's a rough life.
So anyway, the church claims about five to 10,000 Sea Org members worldwide. Again, the actual data does not bear that out. It's estimated to be closer to three to 5,000. The Church of Scientology is based in Los Angeles, California. That's where Hubbard started it back in the 50s. And they have made their corporate headquarters in Clearwater, Florida. And I think they started staking out Clearwater in the 60s or 70s. And uh, I feel sorry for the people that live in Clearwater. It was a very peaceful community of mostly elderly people. And uh, there's uh, several several miles of of beaches there and apparently just a beautiful place and Scientology kind of the Church of Scientology kind of took it over and set up its headquarters there and there's been all kinds of uh, tit for tat um, issues going on between between the town of Clearwater and the Church of Scientology just trying to sue each other and it's, it's just been a big mess but that's where they have set up their uh, corporate headquarters So there's a lot to unpack here. Um, there's so much material on L. Ron Hubbard that um, it's really a judgment call as far as where to draw the line, what I want to talk about, and uh, what you can, what I can just, you know, omit because it's not not that big a deal. But uh, he was born in 1911, and he died in. 1986 his book Dianetics which in Scientology circles is known as book one was written in 1950 that's kind of what started everything it was a New York Times bestseller for 28 weeks in a row now I should say that I should start off by saying that um, Hubbard in a sense made a mistake with Dianetics in in saying that well this is something that you know the, the the concepts in this book anyone can learn anyone can practice anytime any way they want to and what happened as a result of that is different Dianetics organizations were being set up in different parts of the country and an individual by the name of Don Purcell who was a who was a millionaire that became a a follower and a fan of, of Hubbard's who was practicing Dianetics he he actually obtained the copyright for Dianetics practice so Hubbard lost his own creation so to speak and apparently what happened was he was Purcell started the Dianetics Research Foundation in Wichita Kansas around this time many other Dianetics foundations particularly with the ones known as the Elizabethan Foundation were in were hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt they could not pay that debt and in 1952 the court ruled that the Wichita Foundation was liable for that debt and Purcell and the others on the board of directors tried to convince Hubbard to file for bankruptcy Hubbard refused and so the board voted to file bankruptcy Hubbard, Hubbard was furious he tried to sue Purcell but with no luck and the court ultimately auctioned off all of the Elizabethan foundation's assets everything having to, having to do with Dianetics was auctioned off Purcell wound up like I said he was a millionaire he was a rich man so he he won the auction he bought the assets for around six thousand dollars and Purcell thereafter owned Dianetics so as a result of that Hubbard's like well I want to make sure this doesn't happen again so he kind of reinvented himself reinvented his doctrine he took a lot of the same uh, practices and concepts from Dianetics but then added to it um, we'll talk a little bit later about the whole idea that we're a uh, immortal soul that goes goes from body to body over multiple lifetimes and so it was these kind of concepts that Hubbard then added to what he'd already thought up in in Dianetics and he sort of fine-tuned and polished his doctrines and from there he followed a uh, he began using a religious in a business model and so really it started as a business but in a a uh, pretty smart move he put a religious slapped a religious label on it that way he could be 
tax exempt. So all the money that the organization draws in is uh, uh, not ta non-taxable. And Hubbard claimed that these new techniques would restore the uh, theta memories and be more precise than Dianetics. So, so the idea now is that you know, once you become a theta, an operating an operating thetan, as we'll talk about more here in a little bit, you'll once you recover all your memories of past lifetimes then that's really the key to your um, spiritual and worldly success, and it will cause you to continue to be successful in subsequent lifetimes. So basically Hubbard took uh, took these concepts and just sort of slapped a cross on it, literally. I mean, he, he, Christianity was at a very high um, level of success in the 1950s, more than half the American population attended church of some kind, and that actually hit its peak around um, around 1960. Um, more than half, about 69% of the American population attended some kind of some kind of church or another. And so Hubbard was able to successfully get Scientology off the ground if you founded the church in 1954 and you know I guess you could dispute over whether or not Scientology is a religion I would say that it it does qualify because number one it has a founder number two it has a canon of scripture basically everything that L. Ron Hubbard wrote in relation to Scientology is considered scripture starting with Dianetics and again they uh, Scientologists refer to that as book one and they profess a belief in the supernatural, obviously, the idea that we are uh, theta beings that go from one lifetime to another, you know, and it is, uh, and other views that the church has held that we will go into more here in a little bit. Uh, these are obviously religious type views and also Hubbard and the Church of Scientology claim to be able to help with any kind of life problems that you may be experiencing. So it it addressed spiritual concerns as far as what is man, where did man come from, um, postulating that we as humans are spiritual beings with spiritual needs and our organization is equipped and structured to meet those needs. So I'd say it qualifies as a religion, doesn't make it true, but um, but Hubbard added on, I believe, the these uh, spiritual concepts. And by the way, Hubbard back in the 30s was a science fiction author. He was a science fiction author. He he wrote. He has the Guinness. Uh, world record for the num for the number of most written works, so 1,084 total written works. As far as I know, he still holds that record. He was a feverish writer. He would sit. He was known to sit at a typewriter uh, just for hours on end, perspiring, sweat dripping off his forehead onto the typewriter as he was as he was going along. And as soon as the paper on the typewriter ran out, just stick a new roll on there and keep going. And, I, and he'd go through multiple rolls of, uh, of paper on a typewriter just in, in one sitting. I mean, this, this guy just had an incredible amount of, of energy, especially mental energy, creative energy. You know, you can say what you want to about Hubbard. I mean, there's, uh, he's, he's certainly a character. Um, all kinds of different claims have been made about him, claims he's made about himself. I think he really exemplifies the idea of, you know, if you look up delusions of grandeur, you know, there, Hubbard, Hubbard's uh, picture should be right there next to it. He's, he's claimed to have been everywhere and done everything. And the Church of Scientology still fully backs that up. Um, he supposedly had a degree in civil engineering when in actuality he only had two years of college, so he did not finish. 
um, supposedly had all these military awards and honors when in actuality he, he was in the Navy for a few years during World War II. He was even given command of a ship, but he was quickly relieved of that command uh, because he was deemed unfit. He commanded torpedoes to be, uh, and gu or guns, weapons, uh, to be fired on what turned out to be a log. Another time he fired upon a, an island that turns out he thought was a, belonged to the enemy, but turns out it belonged to Mexico, which was an ally. So after that, he was relieved of his command. He supposedly had all these wounds, these injuries that he had he gotten Purple Hearts from. That all turned out to be false. Uh, he did have some medals that were simply for service, I mean, just for being there, but that was that was about it, all the the uh, awards that he supposedly won for injuries and bravery and things like that were all were all just found to be fraudulent. There was a there was an award that the church, I think to this day, still claims that he won that was not even in existence at the time that he was in service back in the early 40s in World War II. So there you go. But uh, he he was in and in and out of trouble the whole time he was in the Navy. His uh, his commanders complained about him that he he just seemed to assume that he had all this authority that he didn't really have and all this knowledge that he didn't really have and just had a lot of delusions of grandeur and and he carried that with him throughout his whole life. He just really thought that he had the answer to. To everything, but there were a lot of inconsistencies in his behavior and his writings, a lot of contradictions, a lot of allegations of abuse. He was married, I think, three times. I think his first couple of marriages were simultaneous, and so were thus rendered null and void. He was charged with kidnapping, having his daughter kidnapped and held for ransom in order to manipulate his ex wife, his wife at the time, later to be ex wife. Uh, just a lot of a tremendous amount of, of drama uh, surrounding Hubbard, but he, he was also very charismatic. And, you know, it takes a great deal of, I think, of intelligence and talent and ability to just to make up all this stuff. I mean, he you can see he's got this record number of written works. And it's just, it's stuff that he just wrote seemingly off the top of his head, but he was able to convince people that it was true and people would have just an un, just a undying loyalty to him. And so, you know, I think, uh, you think of Joseph Smith about how charismatic he was and how he was able to get so many people on his side. I think L. Ron Hubbard puts Joseph Smith to shame. I mean, the man was so intelligent and so charismatic, but yet he was also very, I think, very deceived and very, um, very delusional, um, prone, especially in his later years, to outbursts of temper. And like I said, his uh, more than one of his ex-wives, ex-lovers, alleged that he physically abused them, and not only physically, but just uh, psychologically. And you know, everyone that Hubbard came in contact with were uh, all affected in some way or another. And so definitely a uh, one of a kind, one out of a million type of individual. So anyway, after um, Purcell took away Dianetics from him, he took a lot of the same concepts and reinvented it under a under an organization. So now it's no longer a free for all anymore where you can just you know practice and teach the the things that Hubbard was putting out just wherever and however you wanted now it had to be by the under the sanctioning of the Church of Scientology so and you know I don't know this for a fact I just suspect that Hubbard brought in all this stuff about um, that we'll look at here in a minute about um, Theta beings and the Earth being four quadrillion, or not the universe being four quadrillion years old, and all this supernatural content in order to help qualify his teachings as a religion, to help qualify it as a religion. Uh, that's sort of 
that's sort of my guess and because uh, Hubbard was was quite the the strategist and he thought hey you know we're we're dealing with issues that affect the very core of of humanity and we're curing proposing to cure all of mankind's ills we're addressing spiritual issues so yeah let's uh let's slap a cross on there and call it a religion so that, that's what he did and the only reason that a cross is part of scientology's logo to this day is just for that very reason to look like a religion specifically in america american religion during a time when america was by vast majority christian more than half the population attended church so that explains why scientology is named the church of scientology and has a cross on it it was to attract americans So first let's let's look at let's look at Dianetics a little bit before we move on. What what are things that Hubbard taught in Dianetics that we would see resurface in the Church of Scientology? So Dianetics, first of all, Hubbard defined it as the science of mind. So I I actually read Dianetics last night. Um and uh well let's just say that's uh few hours of my life that I'll never get back you, know, you see you, you see what I do for you people you know I, I I read this crap so you don't have to so anyway I just want to go through some of the some of the high points of it just so you get an idea of how Scientology started and see where they're coming from so I'm gonna so I'll be kind of uh, reading and quoting Hubbard in his own words here so so how does he define Dianetics well he he defines it as a science of mind says a uh, dianetics is not psychiatry it is not psychoanalysis it is not psychology it is not personal relations it is not hypnotism it is a science of mind it needs about as much licensing and regulation as the application of the science of physics so as as hubbard seems to imply here this is something that that anyone can do and he just kind of discovered it but he would later come to regret that because he says over and over again throughout the book, hey, anyone who reads this book can practice what it teaches. And he ended up losing the rights to it as a result. So that's why when he founded the Church of Scientology, it uh, very much did involve licensing and regulation in its application. So something we need to talk about that is crucial and foundational to Scientology theology, Scientologist thought, is the concept of going clear. So what do we mean when we talk about someone who is clear, or better yet, what did Hubbard mean? It says, um, he, he defines the Dianetic clear as an optimum individual with intelligence considerably greater than the current normal. Okay, so a clear is someone who who has been who has been enlightened, and as a result is substantially more intelligent, more capable than the average person. And he, he says, um, the, the Dianetic clear is to a current normal individual as the current normal is to the severely insane. So someone who is clear is to to you or I as average non-clear people as we are to someone who is who is insane so our intellectual capacity is a far above that of someone who is mentally insane well so the clear person who has achieved the state of clear 
is that far above us. So you reach a heightened state of awareness. Now, how does, um, let's see, what else? Let's see, what else does it say? So, in, so a few pages down, he says, a clear can be tested for any and all psychoses, neuroses, compulsions, and repressions. All aberrations that can be examined for any autogenic, self-generated diseases refer to as psychosomatic ills. These tests confirm the clear to be entirely without such ills or aberrations. So if you're clear, then you're not going to get sick. You're not going to have really any major problems. You're pretty much in good shape. You're in good physical and mental health. So... I'm not going to look up all the passages here because uh, that would just take way too long. But um, throughout the book, he talks about what it means to be in a state of clear. And it's it's also it's also a verb in addition to being a noun. So um, so if if someone has achieved the state of clear, then they have become they have become clear. They have erased all the. Um, psychological negative baggage that they've had to deal with up to that particular point in time and someone who has achieved that is known as a clear so if you've been cleared then you are known as a clear so a couple different ways of, of using that term and something that he talks about on almost every page of Dianetics is the concept of engrams. Okay, so what's what's an engram? Well, let's see what he says. It says the dynamics are inhibited by engrams which lie across them and disperse life force. Intelligence is inhibited by engrams, which feed false or improperly graded data into the analyzer. So engrams are, um, I would say, negative perceptions, negative, um, negative elements in your, in your subconscious. And they get there in the prenatal phase. So between the time of conception, when you're conceived, and the time when you are actually born, it is during those uh, nine months or so that you are especially vulnerable. So for that reason, Hubbard in Dianetics talks about how the, the pregnant mother needs to be extremely careful in what she says, what people around her say, what kind of words they use, and needs to make sure to uh, not bump into anything. Obviously, no one should um, subject her to any physical abuse or anything like that because any little thing that happens to that pregnant mother will be stored into that child's negative engram banks. So we have entire banks of engrams. And so when you achieve the state of clear, that means that your uh, engrams have been cleared out of your engram bank. And see if there's a uh, okay. Here we go. Here's an example. Here's an example that Hubbard himself gives. Here's this is an example of an engram. A woman is knocked down by a blow. She is rendered quote unquote, unconscious. She is kicked and told she is a faker, that she is no good, that she is always changing her mind. A chair is overturned in the process. A faucet is running in the kitchen. A car is passing in the street outside. The engram contains a running record of all these perceptions, which includes sight, sound, Tactile, taste, smell, organic sensation, kinetic sense, joint position, thirst record, etc. The engram would consist of the whole statement made to her when she was unconscious, quote unquote unconscious. So all, all of these things that are happening to this um, um, to this individual are 
also affecting her unborn child and will cause that unborn child problems after he's born and when he grows up until he becomes clear. So basically just all that to say that um, that you know, as you're um, as you become an adult and you live your day to day life, these negative engrams, these negative these recordings, and the things that describe the that have to do with that negative event and all the words that were spoken and all the sights and sounds and different things that were going on when that negative event happened uh, between the time that you were conceived and the time that you were born. These are all things that you carry around with you, and certain things can can trigger that. So if you hear something like the sound of a car going by while that incident was happening. Um, if you hear a, if you hear a, the sound of a car going by that's similar, it may, it may trigger, whether you realize it or not, a, a negative thought or a negative emotion, or it'll, it'll inhibit you in some way. So these, these engrams keep you from being everything that you are able to be. So we'll, we'll get more into all that a little bit later. Um, when Hubbard died in, in uh, 1986, in 1988, his successor is David Miscavige. And Miscavige, as far as I know, is still the leader of the church to this day. His official title is chairman of the board. Now, Miscavige was still in his 20s back in 1988 when he, when he took command. He had actually been... Working his way up through the ranks, uh, Hubbard was a was a uh, fan admirer of Miscavige. He saw potential in him, but nevertheless, before Hubbard died, he made it pretty clear that he wanted a a husband and wife couple by the name of Pat and Annie Broker to be his successors. And so, at the time of Hubbard's death, Miscavige and Pat Broker were. Um, were good friends and associates and things like that. And to make a long story short, Miscavige pretty much betrayed and backstabbed Pat Broker, threw him totally threw him under the bus, and from there assumed command, assumed leadership of the organization. Now, David Miscavige is also, a, as you can kind of see from that photo, I think that photo was taken in Madrid in 2004. He's um, very aggressive, very abrasive. He he was born and raised in Scientology. That's all he's ever known. He's always had pretty much everything that he wanted um, from everything that I've read and heard. Basically, just a spoiled brat who just never grew out of it. He just got he just got bigger, and he's known as a He's been referred to as a 1950s tough guy, so really big into guns and cars and just different kinds of weapons, and he's studied martial arts and all this kind of stuff. And there's been numerous allegations by those who have left Scientology at the highest levels that he is prone to fits of rage, I think even worse than L. Ron Hubbard. And during these fits of rage, he's very, very physically abusive. So I mean, you know, punching, slapping, knocking you down, kicking you, all this kind of stuff. Um, those who are at the highest levels of the church who have now left, like uh, Marty Rathbun, and uh, let's see, the guy's name, the other guy's name escapes me at this moment, but those who knew Miscavige very, very well over a number of years, and when they were still members of the church, they denied that this kind of abuse was going on, but then after they left, they were like, yeah, we just, we couldn't, we couldn't take it anymore. So if, if you look up the... Um, Bohemian Rhapsody incident, you'll kind of see, you'll see what kind of guy Miscavige really is, if these allegations are true. Now, here again, I want to say, when you talk to a Scientologist and you talk about all these things that are going on behind the scenes, so the Bohemian Rhapsody incident, all the physical and emotional, psychological abuse at the hands of Miscavige, all the things that have gone on, all the conspiracies, all the scandals, um, Scientologists are taught that that's all just false propaganda. So if you start spewing all that at them, they're not even going to listen to a single word you have to say afterwards. So 
but this is this is just good to know. Um, I think it kind of puts out a sense of urgency that hey, we need to get these people out of this. You know, we need to do what we can to try to talk them out of this organization because it's it's so abusive on so many levels. So anyway, Miss Cavage has been the leader, undisputed leader of the Church of Scientology since 1988. You know, COB, so they'll refer to him as as COB Miscavige. And um, one thing that he probably his biggest accomplishment that I know of is winning tax exemption for the Church of Scientology. So Scientology, as we already said, started in 1954, but in 1967, the church lost its tax exempt status. And Miscavige and Marty Rathbun was instrumental in this as well. They were uh, very, very aggressive in pursuing this goal. And so when they achieved it, it was a big win. And like I said, I don't know of anyone else who's taken on the IRS and won, but uh, they, they put lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit against the IRS. The IRS had been investigating the Church of Scientology, especially in the wake of Operation Snow White. Again, I'm not going to go into all that here. Plenty of other videos. You can look that up. But, but finally, after just a long back and forth th throughout the 80s, early 90s, between the Church of Scientology and the IRS, the IRS finally... We're like, okay, uncle, we give up. We, uh, it, it's, you know, that, that's enough. You know, if, if you guys stop all the lawsuits, you know, then we'll, and just pay us the, the, all the fines that you owe us because the Church of Scientology had, you know, owed, I guess, thousands, if not millions of dollars in, in taxes. And so once they, once they paid that money off to the IRS, the IRS agreed to, to back off and, um, um, restore the tax-exempt status. So since 1993, the Church of Scientology has been officially considered as a religion and has been tax-exempt. So that's probably David Miscavige's biggest accomplishment. And like I said, a lot of that is really due to, to uh, Marty Rathbun and, and others. This is just a picture of a Church of Scientology that I visited a few years ago. This was actually once a, I think, a Baptist church. Some people said Baptist, others said Catholic. I think finally I've determined it's that it did used to be a Baptist church and the church had moved out, had vacated the building for some reason. The Church of Scientology of Greater Cincinnati bought that, bought that building. So you can see the cross there up at the top, that, the cross with the, with like it looks like the, um, Star of Bethlehem turned sideways, uh, running uh, running through it, and you can see that on the the altar pulpit, whatever that is there on the stage. Then off to the left of that, you see a, that's a bust of L. Ron Hubbard, and and going around all the all the windows, there's different principles of Scientology that are that are on these. Um, um, billboards or posters whatever you want to call them that are and banners that are all over the sanctuary and all over the windows and things like that <clears throat> i think they were they were kind of wondering why i was taking pictures i can't remember if i i think i asked if i could take pictures and so that was one that i took i took others but i'm not going to waste time going through all those here so Um, so before I go any, any further and get into their cosmology or whatever you want to call it, I should, I want to go back to the concept of, of engrams because something you'll find in Dianetics, in the book Dianetics and also in subsequent books that were published under the Church of Scientology by Hubbard talk about all of these things as well that your the engrams and in the engram bank that they're stored in are part of the reactive mind so for the scientologist your mind has two parts there's the analytical mind and the reactive mind the analytical mind is where all your thoughts and logic and things like that come from the analytical mind operates like a computer it stores data 
and it is a perfect functioning entity. Now, the reactive mind is where all your engrams are stored. So things that have happened to you in previous lives or during your uh, prenatal period uh, before you were born, any kind of negative incident or thing that happened was stored, was recorded, and even, you don't have to be conscious either. You can be unconscious. You can be asleep or knocked unconscious, passed out, whatever. Um, your reactive mind continues recording all these negative things and storing up more and more engrams. And this keeps you from being able to think clearly. It reduces your intelligence. It reduces your ability to uh, think and reason as well as you could. Otherwise, these things are your reactive mind is associated with pain, uh, sickness, any kind of suffering. Pretty much everything bad comes from the, uh, the reactive mind. So the whole rehabilitative process, first in Dianetics and now in Scientology, is to take you through a process of auditing, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And through that process, you'll get rid of more and more of these engrams until your engram, your engram bank is cleared. You achieve the state of clear and your reactive mind is completely purged. And what that means is now your analytical mind has taken over. So, you know, Hubbard has claimed that those who had a, someone who had an IQ of 80 something like a Forrest Gump level IQ once once he was cleared he had an IQ of like 212 so th these are the kinds of claims that that are made okay so that's really the that's really salvation in a sense like every every religion tends to have some kind of idea regarding salvation so this is the closest thing Scientology has to being saved, really, is being cleared. And being cleared means clearing your reactive mind and all these negative engrams so that then you can function at your um, optimal intellectual performance. You know, you're, there's no longer anything holding you back. You can, you can learn better. You can speak better. And Scientology, the word literally means the way the Scientologists define it is knowing how to know or learning how to learn so just getting better at at a uh, learning and becoming better at absorbing knowledge and things like that and once once you've been cleared and your analytical mind is all there is the reactive mind has been purged and put away and things like that it helps you physically i mean you become almost like a almost like a superman i guess and they say that's why tom cruise is able to do all the stunts that he does and and things like that is because he has been he has been clear. So, with that in mind, let's go back to where it all began for the Scientologists, according to L. Ron Hubbard and their uh, cosmology. And again, these these ideas as far as the origin of the universe and how things got to be the way they are and this whole entire backstory hubbard created all this after he i think after he lost dianetics so he was able to take all the things that he had taught in dianetics but then rehash it and refine it within this larger framework that he built around it and like i said my my guess is that he did this on purpose he took his his background as a science fiction writer and you'll see clear evidence of that and and use that to incorporate supernatural ideology into his system so that then his organization could be considered a religion and it worked incident one then incident one teaches that the universe began four quadrillion years ago and that we are actually thetans and i alluded to this earlier um so there were thetans there were they're immortal beings and they forgot their immortality so kind of like gods but we've forgotten that we're gods we've forgotten that we're immortal beings or immortal souls 
we became separated from our from the original static condition and created the four things mest matter energy space and time so just in a in this confusion how we, we've forgotten who we are all these all these things were were created matter energy space and time now incident two was 75 million years ago and at that time there was what was known as the galactic confederacy which was composed of 76 planets and 26 stars it was ruled over by a an evil overlord named Xanu and members of the Galactic Confederacy were planning a a coup d'etat of sorts to remove Xanu. He found out about it and worked with some conspirators to trap these these Thetans that were plotting against him and imprison them in volcanoes on a planet called Tijiak and then blow them up with hydrogen bombs. So these 75 million years ago, Hubbard taught that that uh, TGAC, which is now Earth, that back then everything looked the way that it looks here on Earth in the 1950s and 60s, as Hubbard is teaching this. You know, every everyone looked and talked just like we do now. The Earth looks like it does now. People drove in cars like now. They paid taxes <laughs> like like they do now. Um, yeah, so uh, pretty. Pretty similar. Uh, we've not come very far in 75 million years, apparently. And Zenu subjected these uh, Thetans to these who uh, were betraying him to R6 implants in front of colossal a colossal 3D motion picture. So this included all these. Um, all these images that were images of God, the devil, angels, all different world religions, and many other images. And the uh, then it's taught that Zenu was eventually caught and imprisoned inside a mountain from which he is unlikely to ever escape. So let me uh, look this up real quick. Okay, so this is this is my favorite part right here. This this is good stuff. Um, so this is. Um, This, so this is Hubbard talking about the Theta beings and talking about Zenu. And this, this is from um, the book Going Clear by, by Lawrence Wright. And by the way, do not reference that if you're talking to a Scientologist because, I mean, they're, they are very aware of this book and they reject it as a, as a source, even though it's extremely well documented and pulls from Hubbard's writings and former Scientologists and things like that. It's all taboo and means nothing to uh, to someone who is still with the organization. It's all just uh, further propaganda. But um, once the uh, the loyal officers had captured Zenu, locked him up in an electrified wire cage. That's right, an electrified wire cage buried in a mountain. Hubbard said he is not likely to ever get out, which is good. I mean, if that's true, I, I hope he doesn't get out. Sounds like kind of a kind of a bad dude. So the uh, so the, these um, so these remaining thetans though that were bombarded with these hydrogen bombs and subjected to the R6 implants. I mean, what happened to, to them? Because the Galactic Confederacy abandoned this planet, but the thetans who were victimized by Xenu were left behind. So I don't know. Couldn't really tell you why they were left behind. Maybe the the good, the Thetans in the Galactic Confederacy that remained thought they were dead, or who knows? I, I really have no idea. But they abandoned the planet, but the Thetans who were victimized by Xenu were left behind. So now they have all these images of God and the devil and angels and different world religions. So if you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or any of these kinds of things, then um, well, then that that's why because you've been subjected to these uh, R6 implants. 
and you need to be free of that. You know, you were um, brainwashed by by Zenu. And so the the idea is that we have been brainwashed, and so now we are going from body to body over multiple lifetimes. And there was a quote that I read, and this this was I thought just fascinating. This was this was good stuff. Um, let's see where was it? After. Okay, here, here it is. And this is really what I was talking about when I said that this was my this is my favorite part. This this is this is good stuff. So make sure make sure you're paying you're paying attention because you'll get the the answer to how how things how things really are right here. So you because know, so at this point we've got we, we're talking about these these brainwashed thetans at on a they're were left behind on TGAC and they're just kind of wandering around looking for bodies to attach themselves to so th this is the concept of the afterlife according to uh, scientologist doctrine so this is the the Thetan has to report to a between lives area, quote unquote, between lives area, as Hubbard explained, which for most of them is the planet Mars. There, the Thetan is given a forgetter implant. The implant is very interesting, Hubbard later wrote. The preclair is seated before a wheel which contains numbers of pictures. As the wheel turns, these pictures go away from him. The whole effect is to give him the impression that he has no past life. The Thetan is then sent back to Earth to pick up a baby's body as soon as it is born. So Hubbard continues, The baby takes its first gasp. Why, a Thetan usually picks it up. Sometimes there is a shortage of new bodies, and occasionally a Thetan will follow a pregnant woman around, waiting for the moment of delivery so he can pounce. So that's that's right. Um, so so a thetan. It seems like a good idea, you know. If you're a you know if you're a uh, thetan that you're looking for a body and that there, there's a shortage of bodies, well, what do you do? Well, you know, I'd, I that's that's probably what I would do. I'd find a pregnant woman and I'd follow her around and wait until she gives birth, and then as soon as that baby comes out, boom, I've got my next body. You know, I'm. I'm ready to live another another life on Earth. Now, what happens if multiple um, thetans are trying to follow around the same pregnant woman? Do they fight over, and then whoever wins the the battle gets to you know gets to actually inhabit that body? I I really don't know. Seems like a seems like a good question. So, um, as Hubbard continues to observe, then. It's quite funny, as a matter of fact. I, I would agree. It's hilarious. Um, the amount of this and that that is paid, the amount of flowers and that sort of thing, which are shipped around as, as dead corpses after the Thetan has shoved off, and so on. It's very amusing. So, yeah, so he's saying, why, why are we spending all this money for, you know, when someone dies on funerals, you know, for flowers and coffins and all this kind of stuff? You know, why, why do that when, you know, really it's just a... a, a, a a Thetan that has ditched his body and moved on to the next one. I, I don't know. So uh, there, there you go. That's the. So that, that, that's that's what we are. And uh, I don't know. I can't remember. Does the next slide talk about that? No, it does not. Oh, so it. A, a future slide may mention this, but it may not. I want to just say, just in case, that. The whole idea then of going clear then is is discovering your inner Thetan. Because remember, we're we are these godlike, you know, immortal souls, but we forget that, right? So, kind of reminds me of the spirit children concept in Mormonism that there are all these little spirit babies in the spiritual realm and they're waiting to get their turn to get bodies here on earth so that then they can 
then they can live their lives on earth, go through a time of testing, and then once they die, if they've done everything that the Mormon church has said that they need to do, then they'll go on to either the celestial or the the uh, telestial realm. Now, if you go to the celestial realm, you actually become a god yourself, and you get your own universe, and you can then have your own spirit children, and the, the cycle continues uh, ad infinitum from there. So... The idea is then once you become clear, once you've purged, once you've got rid of all these engrams and you've got you've purged the reactive mind, now your analytical mind has taken over. Now you were an operating Thetan. Okay. Now, so far there are eight levels of operating Thetan. So once you become a clear, you go you continue the training, you continue the auditing to go through the subsequent levels. Of, of awareness so as an operating phaeton you, you learn how to do more things you discover more powers you know now it's like now you've seen the light and now you're just continuing in your enlightened state and from from the time that since before hubbard died he supposedly had uh the O, the uh, subsequent OT levels after 8, so from OT 9 all the way up to 12 or 16 or something like that. I forget what they were, how many there were, but the subsequent operating Thetan levels beyond 8 were kept in safekeeping, supposedly by Pat and Annie Broker. And so when Miscavige nudged the brokers out of the way and took control, they never could find any such documents, or if they have, they haven't produced them. When I, when I actually visited the Church of Scientology and talked to a lady there, she said that they're supposed to release those OT levels at any time. And I Google it every so often and can't see where that has actually happened. We're still waiting for those to get released. So who knows? Uh, hopefully one of these days they'll get released and we can, you know, those who are fortunate enough to be operating Thetans can continue in their um, awesome supernatural existence. So... So there's that. Now, for the Scientologist who is evangelizing, there's a four-step method. So I just had to turn my light on here. It's getting dark. Four-step method. Step number one, make contact. That's the first thing you got to do whenever you do any kind of evangelism, I would assume. Number two, disarm any antagonism towards Scientology. So they know that all this stuff is out there thanks to the Internet. And like I said earlier, for the Scientologists, for the public Scientologists, they have no clue that any of these scandals and different things are even going on. They probably don't know about Operation Snow White. They probably don't know about the Bohemian Rhapsody incident where the uh, all the these upper-level executives were forced by David Miscavige to play musical chairs and whoever... Um, and th this, this all happened in these... These two trailers were... These two trailers were brought and hitched together to make this like uh, this, this um, I don't know, I don't know what you even call it, but this sort of this like this bunker that all these executives that had offended Miscavige in some way or had done some or had been perceived to have done something wrong were condemned to this to this. Um, to this place, to these two trailers and locked inside of them. There was no furniture. They had to sleep on the floor and the floors were covered in ants and things like that. They were fed. The food they were given were just leftover scraps. And there was no furniture in there, like I said, except for a table. And they were treated really, really bad. And Miscavige forced... Yeah, I wasn't going to tell this, but I, I can't resist. It's He forced these people... To, because he, he wanted them to come up with a, I guess with a different hierarchical structure that he that he liked for, um, for for the church. 
And so they're creating different positions, putting different people in different positions, and they're pr proposing all these different models, and Miscavige has rejected all of them. And they have to stay there until they can um, until they can come up with something. And every now and then, you know, he'd he'd let them out and make them make them beat each other up and make them abuse each other. And there was there was constant sex checking going on, you know, where they had to confess all their crimes. And uh, you know, did you have any negative thoughts or anything whatsoever negative about Miscavige or the Church of Scientology. And if so, you better confess those and pay the penalty for those and just all kinds of abuse going on. So the Bohemian Rhapsody incident is when they took the the album of Queen's greatest hits, put them in, put the CD in, played it. And these executives had to walk around these chairs and keep playing musical chairs and if you lost, if you didn't get a seat, then you were supposedly kicked out of the of the Sea Org, you know, and and therefore separated from your family, friends, and things like that for the rest of your life. And so these people were playing this game, and they were all brainwashed, really, into thinking that, well, we're all here because of something we have done, and so it's our fault that we're here. And David Miscavige is absolutely right. I'm do I'm wrong. I'm doing something wrong. I'm thinking the wrong things. I'm screwing up somewhere. And so he makes them play this game of musical chairs while the while the Queen album is playing. And the idea is that every everyone who loses a seat has to leave until and only the person who gets the last chair gets to stay. And so these people were playing playing this game, this doing this activity and as the chairs got fewer and fewer, they began fighting with each other, like punching, kicking, scratching, biting, all this kind of stuff. Just humanity at its absolute worst. And, and now think about this. They're fighting tooth and nail to get to stay in these, uh, in these horrific conditions. They're fighting to stay. And the ones that lose and have to sit out, you know, they're they're in tears. And Miscavige is berating them, saying, you know, well, where, where are the tears for me? Who's crying for me? I'm the one that's really suffering here. I got to deal with such incompetence. And by the way, the uh, Church of Scientology categorically denies that any, any such things have ever taken place. So um, none of this really happened, according to the Church of Scientology. It's all just propaganda. And so they're... When they make contact, they disarm any antagonism towards Scientology. And, and so then the really the point of entry when when you agree to begin associating yourself with the Church of Scientology and you want to become clear, the very first thing that has to be done is they have to find the ruin. Now find the ruin is is um, whatever it is that is keeping you from being everything you need to be. So how do we get those engrams out of your engram banks and clear that reactive mind? Well, we, we have to go all the way back to to the source, whatever that is. Maybe while your mom was pregnant with you, maybe she ran into a table or something and that experience, unbeknownst to you, has traumatized you. And, or maybe in a past life, something bad happened to you. And your subconscious is remembering that, and that is affecting you, and you don't even know it. So what is it? What's, what's your ruin? We need to find it. Your ruin is what's keeping you from everything that you need to be, everything that you could be. So you find the ruin, you convince the person that Scientology has the answer. You want to, we got courses we can take you through, we got auditing sessions, the purification rundown, all of these things, and all these things cost a whole lot of money, and this is how the Church of Scientology makes its money. Now, the auditing process is is interesting. So they have, and I think I got a picture of it in the next slide or the one after that. During the auditing session, the person who audits you begins asking you all these questions and the questions start out being general enough and then they become more specific because you're holding on to 
and um, an electro um, an, an electro psychometer, which is uh, e meter for short, kind of like a a uh, lie detector. And so you're you're holding on to the handles of this thing. They're looking at the dial. And when they ask a question, so let's say you were abused as a kid. If they ask a question that gets in that territory, you know, and your your heart starts racing a little more, and you know, there's, it begins to show evidence that that that's the case, then the dial starts moving on the e meter. And so that tells the auditor that okay, this the ruin must be somewhere in this territory. And so then they start asking you more specific probing questions. You know, did your, did someone hit you? Did someone abuse you? You know, what's going on? And so the, so again, the goal is to break free of the reactive mind, clear those engrams out. Uh, we already talked about all that. We talked about the clear being free of the reactive mind and being able to remember past lives, being a Thetan, um, between lives, Thetans report to a between lives era, usually Mars. We talked about all that. Forget our implant. We talked about that. And so this all starts with the auditing process. Now in the Scientology talks about the bridge to total freedom. So between the point where you are right now and getting clear during that in-between point, that's known as a bridge. That's a bridge to total freedom. And that bridge has two, um, two components to it. And one of them is you going through the auditing session yourself, but at the same time, you are learning to audit others. And I don't know this for a fact, but I assume the, that Scientology still teaches that you can read Hubbard's Dianetics because that book talks extensively about auditing all the do's and don'ts of auditing someone. And um, what all the auditing process involves. So you, you can learn to become an auditor yourself. So by auditing other people and you being audited yourself, these are really the two um, the two pillars, these are the two components of that, of that bridge that enable you to get to the state of clear. And once you become clear, you've obviously achieved total freedom. What have you achieved freedom from? What's the freedom from your reactive mind and all these, all these engrams, all these negative recordings that are deep in your subconscious. So that's kind of what an auditing session looks like, as you see in front of you. So the auditor is asking questions. The auditee is holding on to um, holding on to those bars, and every time a question is asked that has some kind of impact, that dial moves, and the auditor can see it. So you ask more and more questions, and the auditor may ask you to do all kinds of weird things. There might be a word or a phrase they'll ask you to repeat over and over and over again. So if you're saying, okay, I, I'm, I don't. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? The auditor will give you like a just like some filler words to say. So, just for an example, in Dianetics, on page 227, I believe it is, we see an example of a pre-clear, so someone who's not clear yet, a pre-clear, and an auditor. <clears throat> so the pre-clear, referring to Dianetics, he says, I don't know, I don't know, I just can't remember. It won't work, I know it won't work. The auditor says, go over that, say it won't work. The pre-clear says, it won't work, it won't work, it won't work, etc., etc." Ouch, my stomach hurts. It won't work, it won't work, it won't work. Uh, laughter of relief. That's my mother talking to herself. So, so presumably this is the oddity being, uh, you know, rem suddenly remembering his uh, his prenatal uh, condition when he was still in his mother's womb. Maybe his mother bumped into a table or something happened like that. Now he's supposedly remembering this. 
So, all right, let's pick up another, or let's pick up the entire engram. Begin at the beginning. So then the preclear says, I, quoting the recall with semantics, with pain, I don't know how to do it. I just can't remember what Becky told me. I just can't remember it. Oh, I'm so discouraged. It won't work this way. It just won't work. I wish I knew what Becky told me, but I can't remember. Oh, I wish. Hey, what you got in here? Why, that's beginning to burn. Say, let me out of here. Bring me up to present time. That really burns. Then the auditor says, go back to the beginning and go over it again. Pick up whatever additional data you can contact. The pre-clear then repeats the engram, finding all the odd or all the old phrases and some new ones, plus some sounds. Recounts four more times, quote unquote, re-experiencing everything. Begins to yawn, almost falls asleep. Revives and repeats the engram twice more, then begins to chuckle over it. Semantic is gone, or somatic is gone, sorry. Suddenly, the engram is gone. Refiled and he cannot discover it again, he is much pleased. The auditor then says, go to the next earliest moment of pain or discomfort. Preclear says, uh, mm, I can't get in there. Say, I can't get in there. I mean it. I, I wonder where, then the auditor says, Go over the line. Can't get in there. Pre-clear says, can't get in there. Can't. My legs feel funny. There's a sharp pain. Say, what is she doing? Why, boy, I'd like to get my hands on her just once. Just once. Then the auditor says, begin at the beginning and recount it. Then the pre-clear recounts the engram several times, yawns off, quote unquote, unconsciousness, chuckles when he can't find the engram anymore, feels better. Oh, well, I guess she had her troubles. The auditor carefully refraining from agreeing that Mama had her troubles, since that would make him an ally of Mama. He says, go to the next moment of pain or discomfort. The pre-clear says, I can't. I'm not moving on the time track. I'm stuck. Oh, all right. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. No, it's stuck. It's stuck that time. No, I stuck at that time. Why, that's my coronary trouble. That's it. That's the sharp pain I get. Then the auditor says, begin at the beginning of the engram and recount, etc. Okay, so um, I don't pretend to understand any of that. Um, the, the idea, I guess, is let's find out what's causing your issues and say whatever you've got to say and keep repeating it and keep repeating it until you get comfortable with it. So the idea is to get you to confront your worst fears or your worst troubles. And sometimes the person being audited will get aggressive with the auditor and will yell and scream and use profanity at them and things like that. And Hubbard says, when they do that, that's just the engrams talking. I mean, that, that's all it is. It's just the engrams talking. So don't react to it. Just keep telling them to you know, to repeat whatever they need to repeat, you know, and um, they need to repeat the words or repeat the, and then, then tell, talk about what they're, what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, and then keep repeating it and keep repeating it. It may involve, um, it may involve walk, making certain motions, walking across the room, touching the floor, doing, and doing these kinds of things over and over again until you get numb to it. And that's really the idea, it seems to me, is to get numb to, whatever it was that was causing you so much discomfort until finally it's not causing you discomfort anymore and boom, that engram is gone. So in these, on these auditing sessions, you're going through knocking out, the, with the auditor's help, knocking out all these engrams. And of course these sessions cost a lot of money. And again, that's how Scientology gets its funds. So, good stuff. The goal of Scientology is to clear the planet, as we already talked about. So they want to clear everyone on the entire planet. And the, the idea is that, well, if we can get 75% of the t entire human population cleared, then that's pretty much, you know, the, the rest will follow. It's inevitable. We talked about the OT levels. Uh, the operating Thetan levels. So once you become clear, then you continue moving up the, up the ladder, so to speak, as an operating Thetan. But now you supposedly have all these healing powers. Like there was a time when um, John Travolta was uh, 
was supposedly uh, supposedly healed Marlon Brando. They were at some kind of dinner or something, and Josh Brolin observed all this. Uh, Marlon Brando, on the way to this event, this dinner or party or whatever it was, had stopped to help someone change their tire and or do something on the side of the road. And when that happened, Marlon Brando scratched his leg kind of bad, got a big cut on it, and it and it hurt. And he was so when he got to the party, he was complaining about it. And John Travolta supposedly healed him, like put his put his hand on the wound and just kind of concentrated for a minute. And then Brando was like, "Hey, I feel I feel better." So Josh Brolin described the whole thing as being kind of bizarre. But these are the kind of things you're supposedly able to do when you hit uh, OT. Um, but one of the issues with the whole Lisa McPherson case is that here's a lady who was totally sold out to Scientology. I mean, she had done everything she had, she had worked and paid off, paid her way through getting, you know, doing all the courses and she did everything that she was supposed to do, everything that Hubbard had taught. And nevertheless, she became an operating Thetan. She was, she was declared clear by David Miscavige himself. So that's pretty huge. And so Miscavige was highly involved in her case. <clears throat> but she has some kind of illness. <clears throat> Excuse me. I forget what the exact nature of the illness was, but it, it was a downward spiral. And there were, there were physical and mental components to it. And she eventually went crazy. And um, Scientology would not, the Church of Scientology would not allow her to go seek medical care or anything like that. They kept her at their facilities. And when it finally became evident that this is not getting any better, they drove all the way across town. I'm thinking this was in Clearwater. I could be wrong, but they drove all across town to the, not the first hospital, the one that was closest because she was initially admitted there when all this started. And the people at that hospital were very concerned when some representatives from the Church of Scientology came and checked her out and said, ah, she's fine. The hospital was kind of outraged at that, but there was, I guess, nothing they could do. They they took uh, Lisa away. And so now fast forward to, you know, months later when she's on the point of death. Well, that's that was the closest hospital so they skipped that one they skipped the second one they skipped the third one and they went to the fourth one because there was a doctor working there who was affiliated with the church of scientology by the time they got there she was dead and this was a huge scandal and if if it wasn't for the teachings of hubbard and the church of scientology and them preventing her from seeking medical treatment if it wasn't for all that, then she very well may have lived. Um, so this is someone who was, who was supposedly clear. Um, there's also an account of Hubbard himself. Um, obviously, this is before he, um, this is during the years that he was out on his ship. So he actually had a, from, from 1967 all the way up through, I guess, the, the late 70s or so, he and many others were, uh, he actually had a fleet of ships, and the ship that he was on was the Apollo. And so Hubbard was was on that, um, was, on, was on that ship, and so you can read about all of that. There was, that was, uh, that was all pretty interesting stuff, and a lot of the accounts of Hubbard's behavior and a great deal of Hubbard's time as the head of Scientology was spent at sea, because again, Hubbard was a huge fan of anything having to do with with uh, ships and the ocean and being in the navy and that's why to this day you'll see um you'll see many you'll see those in the sea org wearing navy style uniforms and hubbard had a uniform specially made for himself and we see this kind of thing all throughout you know the history of scientology from that point on so he spent a great deal of time on the sea but there was one incident where they where the ship docked and Hubbard got out and rode his motorcycle and he wrecked and broke his arm and he got back on the ship and for I forget how many weeks after that he was he was not a good patient <laughs> he was uh you know he was crying out in pain and just being very very difficult and horrible to everyone around him and of course he was in a lot of pain but he he sat there with a bottle of with a bottle of whiskey and 
or whatever it was that he and just trying to just trying to bear through the pain and none of Scientology's tactics, none of the Dianetics that he had taught, nothing really worked. So finally they had to get a, a real doctor on the ship to look at him and get him, get him uh, mended up. So, you know, the, the data doesn't, doesn't bear it out. Any, any of this stuff actually works. So, but anyway, the, the belief is that once you become an operating Thetan, then you have all these, you know, you, you don't get sick. You don't, you, you don't break your arm on motorcycles. You don't have mental breakdowns like Lisa McPherson did. None of that stuff really happens. And it's, uh, you know, because you're an operating Thetan now, you're clear. Uh, then the OT level three is a turning point in which, and that's where the OT learns of Xanu, Theta beings, Galactic Confederacy, all this kind of stuff. And so I think Hubbard actually began teaching this when he was um this was around 1967 around the time that he took to the sea and by the way he he started this fleet and took to the sea i think a big part of it was to escape uh, government jurisdiction because the ocean um as far as i know at least not that particular time had no jurisdiction so it was to escape legal troubles is why that he spent so many years on the sea so a lot of interesting stories there. I mean, there are stories of whenever you displeased Hubbard, he'd have you thrown overboard. And then, I mean, you'd get, he'd send someone after you to bring you back out. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, and if, if you didn't seem like you were scared enough at the prospect of being thrown overboard, I'm a good swimmer, huh, whatever. Well then, okay, let's, so uh, then your hands and feet would be tied and you'd be blindfolded, then you'd be thrown in. <clears throat> and eventually you'd be brought back out. But um and then other other uh, methods of discipline included being uh, being locked in like the um, I forget what it was called like the it was some kind of some kind of, of locker where the where the anchor was kept and there are stories of children being locked in there for days on end and denied food and and all this kind of stuff I mean just just horrible stuff nothing compared to what Miss Cabbage would do when he took over but. Uh, so during those years at sea were, were pretty interesting, and this is where we really see Hubbard start to become um, unhinged. But it was around the beginning of this time, around 1967 or so, that um, he would bring in, that he started bringing in people that were operating Thetans and, and unveiled this, uh, this data of OT3. So there's different criteria, different information stored in each of the OT levels. And the belief is that if you are exposed to these things before you're ready, you will die. You will be overwhelmed by the information and it will kill you. So if you're listening to this and you're not clear, you're not an operating Thetan, if you're not at the right level yet, then I guess you shouldn't even be learning this stuff because learning about it will overwhelm you just with its pure with its pure awesomeness. So, so there's that. Um, as I said earlier, OT levels 9 through 15 have not been released yet. So OT3 and beyond focus on purging body thetans, harmful thetans that attach themselves to us and inhibit spiritual progress. So even once you become an operating thetan, you have to focus on getting rid of the these uh, these pesky body thetans. These little beings that um, just kind of feed off of you or like they're parasitic, I guess. I don't know. Um, so... Maybe that was the problem with Lisa McPherson. Maybe, maybe she had too many body thetans. I, I, who knows? So, and very quickly, you can pause this video and go through this if you want, but I don't want to spend too much time going through these things. Um, a SP is a suppressive person. So if you're labeled an SP, then you're pretty much at the level of being shunned. You're persona non grata as far as Scientology goes. A suppressive person is someone who stands in the way of spiritual progress. So if I want to become a Scientologist and my wife says, no, you shouldn't become a Scientologist. Scientology is bad, bad, bad. Well, then my response should be, well, you're a suppressive person. Well, first, first of all, she might be a potential trouble source, right? But if she continues insisting that I not be a Scientologist, well, then she is a suppressive person. Bad. You know, you need to. I'll have to divorce her, shun her, or whatever, you know, and, I, and do the same for my parents and any of the rest of you who try to tell me that I can't be or I shouldn't be a Scientologist. How dare you, you suppressive people, you. All right, uh, potential trouble source. So that's kind of a preliminary to 
I probably really should have put in the opposite. I should have flipped and had PTS first and then SP, but oh well. Potential trouble source, anyone in close, so if I'm in close contact with a suppressive person, so actually if my wife is telling me that I should not be a Scientologist, well, she's an SP, um, you know, assuming she keeps insisting and doesn't uh, let up, keeps trying to stand in the way of my spiritual progress, well, then she's an SP. But as long as I continue to be associated with her, then I'm a PTS. That's also not good. Um, so I have, I'm accident prone. I have negative energy that can be contagious in danger of, you know, I'm in danger of becoming an SP. You know, we, we don't want that. Uh, so ruin, we talked about that, the main impediment to success. So the very, we have to start at getting at the root cause. What's the, what's the cause of your, um, of all your troubles. Well, the, that's your ruin. So that's what the, the auditing process is meant to get at that, find what that is, and then clear those engrams and get you out of it. Reactive mind, we talked about that. Uh, blowing. So blowing is leaving Scientology. So Marty Rathbun, for example, he blew. Um, and many others. If you left Scientology, you blow, or if you abandon your post within Scientology. So uh, many people have done that and continue to, to do that. A security check, also known as sec checking, is uh, interrogation. So if for whatever reason I'm suspected of doing doing something bad or thinking a bad thought that goes against David Miscavige or the Church of Scientology, or, even, or back in the Hubbard days, if I'm thinking something bad against Hubbard, um, then I'm, I'm, in, I'm due for a security check, which is, you know, what... The main question there is, what are your crimes, right? And the purpose of sec checking is uncovering withholds, which are uns any kind of negative unspoken thoughts. So are you thinking anything negative about L. Ron Hubbard? Or are you thinking anything negative about the Church of Scientology or its teachings? If so, then you better spill it. Um, you know, who, who, who did you kill? You know, it's... Um, um, I forget I forget the name of it. But there was an interview I heard a few years ago where this girl said she walked by a room and kept hearing someone yelling at someone else saying, who did you kill? Who did you kill? Who did you kill? She didn't know what it meant, but then later found out that was probably a security check. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't mean you killed anyone in this life, maybe in a previous life or something. You know, you may have killed someone. You need to confess to your crimes, you know, and you better... They don't, when, if you try to say, I didn't do anything, well, then you're just suppressing. That's just more withholds. I mean, you, you're, you're guilty until proven innocent. There is no proving you innocent. You did something, and we're going to get it out of you, some, you know, one way or another. And one way of doing that is the rundown, which is a, uh, there's different kinds of rundowns. And... The idea of a rundown is it's a it's like a purging session. So one example is the purification rundown. Let me look this up real quick. Purification rundown. So it's a program intended to eliminate body toxins that form a biochemical barrier to spiritual well-being. For an average of three weeks, participants undergo a lengthy daily regimen, spending up to eight hours a day in a sauna, interspersed with exercise and taking massive doses of vitamins, especially niacin. In large amounts, niacin can cause liver damage, but it will also stimulate the skin to flush and create a tingling sensation. The church says that this is evidence of drugs and other toxins being purged from the body. Although many in the medical profession have been hostile to the purification rundown, citing it as a fraud and a scam, Hubbard thought he deserved a Nobel Prize for it. And most certainly he, he probably did deserve a Nobel Prize for that. If that doesn't sound fun, I don't know what does. So, purification rundown. So, you may be... A rundown may be in order, depending on what your crimes were, or if you're if you're not confessing crimes, or or what have you. 
I'm not even sure if I can even think of an example of someone getting kicked out of the Church of Scientology because quite the reverse. If you leave Scientology, you're liable to be harassed for the rest of your life. In fact, uh, Marty Rathbun, who I uh, mentioned before, he was David Miscavige's right-hand man, and he was instrumental in helping secure the 1993 tax exemption. And he actually blew more than once. So the first time he blew, Miscavige was able to talk him into coming back. But then a few years ago, he finally decided he had, he'd had enough and he left for good. Rathbun still practices Scientology, but not according to the Church of Scientology's principles. So there's quite a few like Rathbun who they're still practicing Scientologists. They still believe in Hubbard's doctrine and things like that but they believe that under Miscavige that Scientology has lost its way. Such a person is referred to as a WOG, a non-Scientologist. I'm sorry, nope. Um, a WOG is a non-Scientologist, that's true, but someone like Marty Rathbun who practices Scientology outside of the organization is known as a squirrel. So if you're practicing Scientology or Dianetics or anything like that, um, Without the authorization of the Church of Scientology, then you, my friend, are a squirrel. You don't want to be a squirrel. So, anyway, there's much more that could be said about the Church of Scientology. Um, again, when talking to a Scientologist, I would I would recommend just sticking to the Sticking to the theology, sticking to the doctrine, I wouldn't bring up the... I think it's good to know about the Bohemian Rhapsody incident and Lisa McPherson and and all all these kinds of allegations that have been made against the church. There's tons of material out there. There's um, David Miscavige's niece. She left the organization several years ago, and she wrote a book called uh, Beyond Belief. My Secret Life Inside Scientology and My Harrowing Escape. So written by Jenna Miscavige Hill. So I would recommend that one. This is someone who was born and raised in Scientology, who was David Miscavige's niece, and she wound up leaving. And leaving Scientology is probably one of the hardest things you can ever do, especially for someone who, you know, your friends, your family, everyone is in it. Now, the guy that she was dating and eventually married left with her. But it doesn't always happen that way. And uh, it's caused so much pain and suffering and agony for so many people. And it's it's very destructive. It's destroyed families. It's destroyed minds. The, the very thing that it purports to, to fix is what it often destroys. So um, it's, Scientology is... Uh, fascinating a fascinating thing to study but also it's it's a uh, very dangerous and and if you if you're an empathetic person at all you'll read things that will outrage you just seeing what's been done to people and Jenna, Jenna Miscavige Hill I mean she may never get over uh, the things that, that she went through I mean things that the kind of things that someone like that goes through it's it can scar you for life and it's like a you know, someone who is growing up in, in a environment of, of abuse, you know, you don't, it, those scars are often permanent. So Scientology is, I think, fortunately going, um, going the way of the dodo bird. And that's, that, that is a, that is a good thing, it seems to me. But when we talk to people that are Scientologists, you know, if you're interested in having a, a good, productive discussion, I would just stick to the theological issues, maybe ask questions, clarify some things. I'd studied Scientology for a while, but then I went to a church of Scientology and talked to a lady there and said, okay, here's my understanding of Scientology belief and, and theology. And, you know, is, is, is this accurate? And she said, yeah, it was. So I don't know how often she had come in contact with someone who'd actually taken time to study their, their beliefs, but um, to be able to uh, study their beliefs and know where they're coming from and then interact with them in a, in a respectful and non-confrontational um, or non, uh, 
I don't I want to say this, but like in a non-threatening way is I think definitely the way to go. So it's it's always good to know I think where where people are are coming from if you don't if you don't take time to know where they're where they are coming from especially in a group like Scientology you know you and the Scientologist may just be talking past each other and you, you don't, may not get any kind of productive conversation going on so anyway that's my uh, presentation on Scientology I hope you found that to be useful and thank you very much until next time